Thank you. You may be seated. Uh, to start out with a standing ovation, I think that's probably a good thing, right? So um, everything's downhill from now. Um, I, um, I want to ask for your forgiveness for uh, my voice and uh, potential coughs here in between. Um, so uh, hopefully I can get through this. But as Pastor Kevin mentioned to you, uh, we are in a series called Faith That Works. And specifically, this is a book through the, the book of James. And the reason why uh, this is such an important study is, is that if you've been tracking with the series or maybe you've read the book of James before, you understand and know that James is not only a very practical person, but specifically, James is also a brutally honest person as well. And sometimes it's painful to hear. And so I want to just start out from the very beginning to say that if I were to have picked the topic that I would be, be preaching on as a guest speaker here at Lighthouse today, I would not have picked this topic. Um, and yet, at the same time, James knows that we need to talk about certain things in our lives, and it's a necessary thing. So uh, I'm honored to be able to do that. Today, we're going to actually be talking about something that is in you and something that is in me. Something that is in all of us, and as this is in all of us, it actually keeps us from doing the things that we should. I'll give you some clues um, as I read through this list so that you can maybe guess the topic and I wouldn't have to say it. Um, so here's uh, some of the clues, right? This is, one, uh, this is the one thing that keeps you from celebrating other people's successes. This is the one thing that keeps you from initiating an apology when you know that you're wrong. This is the one thing that keeps you from initiating apology when you know that you're only 5% wrong and the other person is 95% wrong. It's the thing that keeps you from arguing your point after the fact that you realize that you don't really even have a good point, but you keep arguing anyways. It keeps you from admitting your loss. It keeps you from admitting your weakness. It keeps you from admitting that you need help. It keeps you from admitting that you don't know what you're doing, even though everybody else knows that you don't know what you're doing. It keeps you from being honest with yourself. It keeps you from being honest with others. And it keeps you from learning new things because you want people around you to think that you know everything. Anybody want to guess what the topic is? What is it? Pride. Now, I know that you walked in here saying, I am a super arrogant person, and I'm so full of myself, and I've got major pride issues, and I'm so glad that you're talking about this today, right? I don't think that you're necessarily saying that. Because here's the thing. None of us would say that I'm an arrogant person. But we know arrogant people, right? We know prideful people. So I want you to uh, entertain this exercise for me. Which human being have you thought about most in the last seven days? Which human being have you thought about most in the last seven days? I, I think if we were to be honest... And I think if we were to admit it to ourselves, the reality is, is that the answer would be me. The answer would be you. The answer would be us. And that is pride. In fact, that's all pride is. Pride is actually an, ob an obsession with self. Uh, think about this, for example. Think about a group photo. When you take a group photo, or let, let's say even a group selfie, and you take a group selfie together, and you look at the photo, guess who the first person you look at in that photo, right? It's you. And not only do you look at yourself, and that's the first thing that you look at, but you actually judge on whether this is a good group photo or not based upon how good you look in that photo, right? I mean, this is so true. Or, or let's rewind the clock a little bit and remember the time when we used to have yearbooks and remember at the end of the year we would get these yearbooks and we would sign these yearbooks and say, keep, keep in touch, K-I-T, have a great summer, all these things, right? But what was the first thing that you did when you first got your yearbook? You would actually go to your class, your grade, and your picture that you had already picked out in the first place, right? And this is the first thing that we see because this is what we are. This, we, we are all about ourselves, unfortunately. Uh, guys, think about it when you were growing up as a little kid. And, and in every scenario, you were counting down because you were thinking about that last shot at the end of the game when you were the basketball player and you had five seconds left on the clock, right? Five, four, three, you're dribbling down the court, three, two, one, and you hit it, 
and it goes swish into the basket. The clock stops. The crowd goes wild, and you win the game, right? Or if you're a baseball fan, it was always, the scenario was always the bottom of the ninth. It was always the full count. It was always two outs. And at the end of this game, you hit the knock or the walk-off home run, just like the Dodgers did last night and the night before, right? You hit the walk-off home run, and the crowd goes wild, and you win the championship. But never in those scenarios, never in those scenarios were you on the bench, right? You were actually the one that was shooting, or you were actually hitting. Because we are all hardwired this way. This way. At the end of the day, we think about ourselves more than anyone else because we are obsessed with ourselves, and this is a form of pride. It's in you. It's in me. It's in all of us today, and you've been a victim of it. You've been a victim of it in your family, in your relationships, at your workplace, and you've also given it as well. But the problem of pride is this, that it is so easy to see in other people and yet it's so difficult to hold the mirror and see it in ourselves. And that's the difficult thing about pride. And so James is going to actually tell us something about this today because he's saying that it's actually much more subtle than that, which means that if we think that we are not prideful, and yet all of us are, then that means that there are people in our lives that are victim of our pride and that we have affected them. Because pride is in all of us, including the preacher here this morning. Uh, years ago, I had an intensive week of counseling, and, and I remember sitting with this counselor, and one of the first questions that he asked me was this. He said, where are you in your pride journey? Where are you in your pride journey? And I acted dumb, and I asked, well, what do you mean? Yeah. In fact, I actually told him that I pride myself on the fact that I am not prideful, right? And he chuckled, and, but by the end of the week, I had a huge reality check that I am actually not further along in this journey than I had thought. In fact, think about the relationships that we have. Think about the arguments and the fights and the quarrels and the conflict that we have in the relationships that, of our lives. What is it that causes those things? Well, all of us in the room would say, well, when, when it's about this person, it's actually because we don't get along because of what they've done to me. It's because of what they said, because of what they said that they were going to do that they didn't do, because they've treated me this way. And we would actually point to the circumstances of those things rather than look at the source of the problem. And James is going to challenge us here this morning. And he's going to actually say, hey, it's time to actually look below the surface Time to stop pointing fingers and actually see what really causes these struggles in our lives. And so we're going to look at this in the fourth chapter of James. But before we actually read these verses, I want to give you a challenge. And the challenge is this, that if you've got the guts, if you've got the courage this morning to open your heart, to open your mind, here's the promise this morning. That because of this truth, it has the potential to shape your life in a way that you will no longer blame other people for your unhappiness and discontentment. And in fact, the challenge this morning is to actually listen to James's words for myself, for you, not for somebody else. Today is an elbow-free zone. You don't, you keep your elbows to yourself. This message is not for the person next to you. This is a message for you. James is speaking to you, so allow God and James to speak to you this morning. All right, James chapter 4, starting from verse 1. You can look in your Bibles or you can read along on the screens. This is what it says. What causes fights and quarrels among you? I mean, this is the same question that I just asked previously, right? What causes these fights and quarrels among us? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? He starts out of the gate, as you would think that James does, and he comes out, and he basically is contrasting two things. He's basically saying, hey, what is happening among you is actually something that is happening within you. Let me say that again. What is happening among you is actually what's happening within you. Your temptation is to think that the reason that you have the problems relationally is because of the things that are happening among you. But the reality is that there is a part that we play that is happening within us. James is saying that the conflict 
is not necessarily just between two people, but that actually it's about something that's happening within. The reason we have conflict outside is because we have an internal conflict within. And the battle among you is a battle within. It's the battle that we cannot contain on the inside. And so because it's not contained on the inside, it spills out to the people who we love the most. And isn't that interesting that we actually hurt and we actually end up apologizing to the people who we love the most because they are right next to us, because we're not winning the battle from within and because it's overfilling into those people in our lives. Why is that? Well, James is saying that it's because of the external. It's because the internal conflict that spills out into the external. And the people that are close to you catch that overflow. Now, let me tell you why this is such a hard, hard truth. This is the reason why it's so hard. It's because if you hurt me, then I'm mad at you. And if I'm mad at you, then I want everybody else to be mad at you as well, right? I mean, that's the way that we are wired. And so at the moment that I take responsibility for my own emotion, I actually now lose my story. And I can't get everybody against you any longer. And because of that, I take the blame or I take some part of the responsibility and I can't tell, tell my sad story anymore. And the people that I want to not like you are not going to like you or are going to like you and, and not not like you anymore, right? And so this is the difficult thing. But James is saying, hey, we've got to acknowledge that we play a part in this and that we have our peace in this and that there is an internal conflict within us that we have to work at. James is reminding us that we've got to admit it, that we've got to grow up, that we've got to understand that the battle within you is causing the battle among you. Now listen to what he says in verse 2. He says this. The battle within us is because you want something, but you don't get it. I mean, that's the summary of it all, isn't it? If we think about why we're quarreling and why we're arguing with one another, it's because I want something that I can't get or that, that I want, and you want something that you can't get and that you want. And so because of that, that's what actually causes these fights and quarrels among us. If you think about the conflict, this is the reason why we're mad. This is the reason why we're depressed. This is the reason why we're angry. Because if we boil it down, it's actually because of the fact that we want something. We don't have it. We can't have it. And we want it. You peel back the layers of anything and everything that you've gone through from a perspective of conflicts and arguments and fights. And you realize that there is something that maybe you don't even know what it is. But you want it and you can't have it. And this is what the source is. Now, the thing about this principle is that it's so easy to see in kids, isn't it? I mean, when you think about kids, they always are starting the fights and the quarrels and the, and the conflict because they want more. It's not fair. It's my turn. It's those things that they want. And because of what they want, they're in these battles. They're in these fights. But no kid actually stands up in a, situa a situation like that and says, you know what, it's because I want what I don't have, and because of that, I'm acting this way. No kid does that, right? But no adult does too, it seems like. So many times we act just like the kid, and we act out in just the same way, and our Heavenly Father is looking to us and reminding us, hey, you're mad you're upset, you're depressed, you're angry because you didn't end up just getting what you wanted. And Maybe it's time to take some responsibility on that. And then James begins us to tell us what we do when we don't get our way. We kill, we covet, but you cannot have what you want, and you quarrel and you fight and you don't have because you do not ask God. James is actually talking to the Christians here. He's talking to the church. And so he's not literally saying that we go and murder people because we don't get what we want. But he's actually saying that we take extreme measures in our relationships because when we get what we don't want, when we don't have what we don't want, what, what we want is we take extreme measures to sever the relationship, to damage people, to say harsh things, whatever it takes to get people on our side of things because we want our own way. And James is saying, oh, my gosh, think about this. 
What's that internal battle in you that you are losing right now? Examine that, James is saying. In fact, what happens is, after all that, and finally, when we can't get what we want, after all of those things, then we go to God as a last resort. In fact, that's what he says. He says, when you ask, verse 3, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives, that you have spent, um, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Now, a lot of times what happens is we actually, uh, we don't go to God first in those things. And because we don't go to God first, we try to work it out all ourselves, and we try to do the initiating, and we try to do all those things that fight and quarrel, and we try to get what we want. And when we can't get that, at the end of the day, then we ask God, and God's saying, hey, you've asked now for the wrong motives. That's not the reason why I'm here. In fact, he's actually saying that it is all about filling your own pleasures, your own desires. That word pleasures is actually the same word as desires in the first verse. And he's basically saying, hey, this is what you want for yourself. That Greek word is hedone, in which we get our word hedonism. It's, it's our pleasure. That's what we want. But God is saying, hey, you don't get what you want. And you don't get when you ask God because your motive is for your own pleasure. And we're stuck on this. And it drives us with the battle that we lose inside. And James calls this pride. Now, think about some of these scenarios for a second. Have you ever noticed that when another person ignores you, he's rude. But when you ignore him, you are preoccupied with something really important. When another person is set in their ways, he is stubborn. But when you are set in your ways, you're being consistent and following your convictions. When another person does, doesn't like one of your friends, he is prejudiced and showing favoritism. But when you don't like one of their friends, you're a good judge of character. When another person is mild-mannered, he is weak. But when you're mild-mannered, you're gracious. And when another person says he thinks... Uh, oh, says whatever he thinks, he is opinionated and he's raw. But when you say what you think, you are authentic and real. And when another person speaks to you about your pride, he's being arrogant and judgmental. But when you speak to another person about their pride, you're being helpful and godly. I mean, this is so convicting, isn't it? Because there's this destructive thing in us called pride that blinds us of the truth and spins it in a way that makes us superior, judgmental, unaccountable, and isolated. Pride makes us believe the lie that we are made bigger in those situations when in actuality we can all look at that and say, man, you are so much smaller. That's because pride diminishes our capacity to admit, to apologize, to acknowledge. So what pride does is it crowds the people out in our lives. And we have no room for not only the people, but the saddest thing is that when we're full of pride, we actually don't have room for God. Psalm 10, 14, 4 says this, In his pride, the wicked man does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. Because in our pride, we have no room for God. And we don't even need the Bible to tell us. What's the expression that we use when we see somebody that's full of pride? We say, oh man, they are really full of themselves. And if you're full of yourself, you can't fill it with anybody else. And you can't fill it with God. And because we can't fill it with God, when our pride is not in check, it leads us to a practical atheism where God no longer exists in our lives. So this is what pride looks like. Maybe if you're a Christian today, your prayer life, spotty prayer life, could be a sign of your pride. Why? Because if your prayer life is spotty, then it's basically saying, hey, I'm not actively dependent and relying on God, nor am I aware of my need for him, because I can do it myself. That's basically what we're saying when we choose to live our days without him. Or what about anger? Pride reflects itself as anger, where we're not trusting God's sovereign control, where we're taking matters into our own hands, and we are losing the battle from within. 
or it manifests itself in a critical spirit. And we basically put people down in order to lift ourselves up. And so we have an inflated sense of ourselves by putting other people down. What about a defensiveness to criticism? It suggests that I'm taking myself too seriously, that I think of myself too highly, and that we need to get that in check. And then the last one is impatience about having to listen, having to wait, having to serve, having to, to, to be anonymous or to be led by someone. All these are hints of an overdeveloped sense of importance. Now, if I just stopped right there, and if James just stopped right there, that would be pretty discouraging, right? I mean, we would say, wow, we're all prideful people. Let's pray, you know, right? That would be terrible news. But the great thing about James is he gives us practical advice. And he tells us why and what we need to do in our pride. Verse 6, this is what he says. He says, but he gives us more grace. That's why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but if grit gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. See, pride and selfishness go hand in hand. And the only thing that could curb pride and selfishness is humility, is humility. Grace is given to those who are humble. I mean, think about it for a second. Why would God give grace to somebody who believes that they have all that they need? Why would God give grace to somebody who is selfish and prideful? God gives those grace to the people who need it and who is in the posture of humility. In fact, grace actually always flows downhill. It always flows downhill. And so we've got to put our place in a posture to receive that grace. And when we elevate ourselves, we cannot receive God's grace. But only and only when we put ourselves in the posture of humility is when we can receive his grace. Or another way to say this is, and if you hear, forget everything that I say today, Maybe this is the one thing that you walk out of here, and this is it. That only humility will get you out of what pride got you into. Only humility will get you out of what pride got you into. And as practical as James has been, he continues to show us. Look at what it says in verse 7. Submit yourselves then to God. Let God be the God of your life. Let God be in control of your life. Put him in charge. Yield yourself. This is the starting point. This is where we say, hey, the battle from within, I'm relinquishing that control, and now, God, you are the one that's in control of that. You are the one that is sovereign over that. And now the conflict inside, we start to win because now we let that go. We surrender that before God. And as we surrender that, that civil war in us, that's a real, real issue, we start getting peace because now it's not up to us. But it is because of what God and his control and his surrender does in us. And so then when we get upset, when we get irritable, when we get angry, and we basically then at that point surrender, humble ourselves, submit to God, and put God in the charge, we will have a peace that is the internal peace that will flow outside. And now we've reversed the cycle. He continues and he says, resist the devil and he will feel for, uh, free, flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. And that word resist, by the way, is a war term. It's actually used in battle. Resist and he will flee from you. Resist it internally, that battle within, and he will flee from you and come near. And as we come near, God closes himself to us, and he then gives us the desires of his heart, not our personal desires. See, only humility will get you out of what pride got you into. He continues, and he says, Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, wail, change your laughter to your mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Here's the interesting thing, is that all of us will be humbled. The question is, do you want to be humbled, or would you rather humble yourself? 
I think so many times people can share experience after experience about how they have been humbled through the experiences that they've had. And I think that's probably unavoidable, to be honest with you. But what if we were able to minimize that in our lives? And what if we had the posture to humble ourselves first before God? And as we humble ourselves before God, that God would be the one that would lift us up. In our attempts to lift ourselves up, it just leads to quarrels, to fights, to conflict. But when the Lord lifts us up, he fills us with grace. Humbling ourselves is one of the most hardest things you will ever do in your life. Humbling yourselves is the sum of the daily decisions that you will have in your lifetime because humbling yourself is, a, is something that we're not used to. Our propensity and our bent in this world is to be about ourselves. And yet when we humble ourselves, God gives us the strength to do so. And not only does he do that, but as we make those daily decisions, it's something that will grow in us. Years ago, I uh, had a near-death experience. I went to my first spinner's class at the gym. And uh, in this class, when I walked in, um, I don't know if I was more intimidated or scared by this reputable in instructor that I had heard about or of all the estrogen that was in that room, but I was definitely intimidated, right? And when you start off in a spinner class, you sit on a bike and there is this knob. It's called the resistance knob. And this resistance knob is really what all that 60 minutes is all about. In fact, it doesn't feel like 60 minutes. It feels like way, way more than 60 minutes. But the whole 60 minutes, she is yelling and screaming at you to turn the resistance up. Turn the resistance up. In fact, the whole class is all about adding resistance and removing resistance, adding resistance and removing, even though in my case there was more removing resistance than adding resistance. And I couldn't really hide it because actually my resistance knobs was squeaking, and so I would turn it down at times we're not supposed to, but everybody knew that I was turning it down. But the instructor and all of us in the class, they knew, and the instructor knew, and I knew, that when you had the resistance up at its highest, that actually it was in those moments where you were growing stronger and you were building your perseverance to be able to do longer than you ever have before. In fact, one point in the class, one point in the class, uh, she says, I want you at this point to turn up your resistance all the way, okay, which I hadn't done the whole class, but she said all the way. And I'm going to count to 30, and I want you to do a full court press. I want you to give it all that you have in 30 seconds. And I said, okay, 30 seconds I can do. So I cranked it up all the way. In 30 seconds, she's counting down from 30, 29, 28, 27, and she's going all the way down until she gets to five. And I'm bur it's burning, but I'm going to give it my all in these last five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. One, and she says, no, 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 before you touch that knob. And I was like, what? What do you think? Before you touch that knob. She said, do you feel that? And all the ladies in the room were like, yes. And I'm like, yes. She said, that right there is your muscle getting stronger. And I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that because so many times what happens when we work on things in our lives, it actually feels weaker in those moments. It actually feels more painful in those moments. But the reality is when you do so in obedience, you're actually getting stronger. And as you're getting stronger, God is saying, I will make you a promise that if you humble yourself, you don't have to do it on your own. I'll be with you. So, what do we do? Practically, how do we deal this, with this? And I'm going to ask the band to come up uh, as they get ready for this last song. But as we deal with this, what are we to do as we take on pride? The first thing that I would challenge you to do is this. Take an eye exam. And I'm not talking about this eye. I'm talking about this eye. Because do you know what the, the, the middle letter in the word pride is? And we have to take an eye exam. And we've got to review our last 24 hours. And we've got to review the next seven days. 
And we got to look at ourselves and say, okay, how much is my world revolved around me? And the decisions that I make revolve around me. How do I have to examine that in my life? Because understanding that when you look at the cross, the cross is basically one capital I crossed out because Jesus is basically saying, hey, I humbled myself to the cross in obedience and in faithfulness so that you didn't have to. And he took that on for us. And so that's the first thing that I would say. The second thing, that as you do this eye exam and as you discover these things in your life, that the second thing that you would do is to repent and to ask God for forgiveness, but also ask the people in your life for forgiveness. And this is a tough thing. When you say to your child, I was wrong, that's tough. When you say to your coworker, man, I, I, I own that. That's my fault. And that's basically saying, hey, in the economy of God, God desires that if we humble ourselves, it's not our purpose and our right to make things just and right. But that he is the one that is going to lift us up when we humble ourselves. And then the third thing that I would say is this, that you would humbly give thanks. Humbly give thanks. When you are in the posture of giving gratitude and giving thanks, you're no longer in that entitlement mode. You're no longer in that position that says, I, I, what, what about me? What about me? But it's about what God has done or what he will do in your life. So what would it look like if we were to challenge pride? I mean, if we stood up to pride and say, pride, you are no longer my master. You are no longer my ward, and you are no longer my boss. And we were able, actually able to say, pride, watch this. I'm going to apologize. I'm going to write a thank you. I'm going to compliment. I'm going to shut my mouth for once. I'm going to stop being passive aggressive. I'm going to stop saying I'm entitled to. Admit that you have an addiction. Admit that you can't keep up. Tell somebody in that moment, I wonder what God does as you humble yourself. I love the way that James ends this chapter because then after all of that, he now gives us, why do we need to do this? Why is this so important? He says in verse 13, he says, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to this and that city and spend a year there and carry on business and make money. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? Your life is a mist that appears for a while and then vanishes. See, the reason why this is so important, because it's so sad if we think about it, that we were so stubborn and we were so prideful that we didn't apologize, we didn't admit, that we didn't reconcile when tomorrow isn't even guaranteed. Our lives will be filled with superficial relationships, with, with relationships that are held at arm's length. And in the midst of that, our life, though, is just simply a blip on the radar. It's a mist that literally you spray and it goes away. That's how short life is. And yet we held on to that pride and that bitterness and that anger for what? What if we changed our perspective? Because if we change that perspective, what would it actually look like? Imagine, imagine if we all were able to, to grow in this area. What would our marriages look like? What would our parenting look like? What would our workplaces look like? What would our schools look like? What would our friendships look like? What would this church look like if we had this posture of, of humility with one another? So as I close, let me ask you, where are you in your pride journey? Where are you in your pride journey? Because tomorrow, it's not guaranteed. Life is a myth. And only humility, only humility will get you out of what pride got you into. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for reminding us today that we are so deceived into thinking that all these things the fights and the conflicts and the quarrels that we have is everybody else's fault. 
reality is that we have our place too. And so what you desire for us is to own it, is to admit, is to surrender and submit and start humbling ourselves daily before you so that we can build this muscle and that that gets stronger and stronger. And as we do so, you promise that you will lift us up. Thank you, God. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, let's all stand and sing.